Welcome everybody to the uh, final event of Zeek Week. Uh, we traditionally do a panel. Um, we usually try to have a selection of people from the community uh, as well as some core team members. So uh, I'm going to introduce each of the folks here. Uh, then I'll ask them a couple questions and then leave time for the uh, audience to be able to ask questions. That's usually the most important part of this. Um, traditionally, we have a mic that we can have out there. Uh, unfortunately, this year we don't have that. So if you can kind of say your question out loud, uh, as loud as you can, I will try to then repeat it so it gets captured for the recording purposes. So um, on the left here, uh, probably needs no introduction, but I'll do one anyway. Uh, Robin Somer, he is the uh, co-founder and CTO of Corelight. Um, he's also a merge master of Zeek. Um, if Vern is the grandfather of Zeek, then I think Robin might be the father at this point, having been around long enough. Um, <laughs> Let me think about that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Fatima Banatwala is a security engineer at the University of Delaware. Uh, she is a Zeek contributor. Um, she's made a bunch of improvements to the DNSSEC parsing, um, as well as she's got a lot of really nice inventory-oriented packages. Um, so her contributions over the last couple of years have been great. Um, Vlad Grigorescu is a security engineer at ESNet. Uh, he is also a core team member of Zeek. He's been around for a number of years in the community. Um, Zeke, uh, or Vlad rather, likes protocol parsers, rock climbing, and whiling away his holiday break working on SANS challenges. Uh, and then Amber Grainer, of course, is our new director of community at Corelight. Uh, she's probably going to try to herd all of the cats. So. Uh, the first question that I'd like to have each of you, starting with Robin and working along, uh, is tell us a little bit how you got started working on Zeek. Um, Zeek was recent, but I got started working on Bro in about 2002-ish, 3-ish, I think. And I was still as a, as a grad student back in Germany. Um, and my advisor at that point, I was just trying to look for a topic to, to work on as a, as a student. And my advisor um, knew this guy in Berkeley, Vern, who just kind of had started working on this new IDS, and uh, he suggested to me that I would just try um, set it up at the local university there and, 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 and play around with it. And uh, so I did, and um, it all went from there, essentially ended up spending a couple of summers uh, in Berkeley at the International Computer Science Institute working with Vern, and um, later come, came out as a postdoc to do um, a lot of research in that space using Bro as a research platform um, for, for many of our projects. And um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, so I got introduced to Bro four years ago. Uh, in 2015, I still remember the first time I heard Bro and I misundertook the name. Uh, so I got hired right after, right, after, right after my college. I graduated in um, summer of 2015. And then uh, University of Delaware in Central ID team, they were looking for a security engineer to join the team. Uh, so uh, in, after my interview was over, my manager was going over the set of tools that, that they were using at that time. And then he was going over all the different ideas. So universities do not have a lot of funding. So they, are ha they actually are based on uh, open source free tools. And uh, the sec the, one of the tools he mentioned was Bro Ideas. And we would, we would like you to write some uh, scripts for detection. Uh, we have Bro running, but we would like you to improve it and uh, to improve uh, the overall detection and, uh, in, and grow the cluster in size because we are not monitoring a whole lot of traffic right now. And I just stuck to that first word because that was the first time I, I heard it. And then I didn't want to like say that I don't know about it. But then I said, OK, Pro Ideas, I will Google it. I have not heard of that Ideas before. And he's like, no, it's not Pro. It's Bro. It's, it's with B. And I was like, OK, it's, it's, a, it's a strange name for an Ideas. And then I looked it up. Uh, on the Google, and then I, so at that time, I was still a research assistant uh, that summer. So my job, my part of job that summer was to spin up Bro IDS, learn more about it, learn, learn the scripting language. It was super easy. I had it running on VM right like in a couple of minutes, and I started learning more about it. And then uh, after some time when I joined the team, I told him that next time you will hire somebody, I will make sure that whenever you say that we are running Bro, now Zeke, that person would not say that I have not heard Bro. And we are making a lot of improvements. Uh, so we actually added Bro as a curriculum uh, course that we offer uh, labs on to our master's students because we know that uh, in a lot of times when we are learned something, we don't directly apply it to the industry. And those two areas are pretty different. And that I experienced when I was interviewing with uh, a lot of companies that 
whatever knowledge I have gained is not directly applicable. So we made sure that we introduced the tools that are widely spread, widely used in the industry. So we actually run a, a proper course called Topic, Topics um, 19, which actually introduces the students with all the industry level, uh, industry grade uh, idea systems that are being used, and Bro is one of them. So every year we have a course on Bro specifically. So people actively in University uh, of Delaware are using Bro as their uh, as one of the tools to do, to, do, to do their research. So that's how I got introduced, and then I realized that we need to make people familiar with the name. So that, because it's a great tool to use, and it has so many benefits, not only in the industry, but academia as well, if, the peop if people are doing research. Uh, so yeah, that's how I got introduced to Bro. And then my first broke on, uh, when, I when I started with Zeek, or Bro that time, I had so many questions, and so many small questions that I wanted to, an that I wanted to get answers. And my first broke on in 2016. I met all the people who uh, who I was just seeing them their names online, like GitHub repositories of those people, and I was using their scripts because at that time I was not very proficient in writing the scripts. So I was just picking and choosing all the scripts that were out there, installing it on our cluster and running it. And those scripts were finding really good things. So it was like right out of the bat we were getting so many benefits. So I really wanted to meet those people and to ask them questions at how they got started. And that was the first time I met the developer team in 2016, and that was my first exposure. And then from there, it just kicked off, uh, like uh, writing the scripts and learning more about Bro. And then we expanded our cluster. So now we have two Zeek clusters in our, in our organization. One is looking at internal traffic, and one is looking at the um, north, north, uh, north south traffic. So yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Awesome. I always get so excited about how you got started with Bro, and that's the first story I wanted to tell, that I heard Bro, and I misunderstood Bro as Pro, because that was a strange name for ideas at that time, but not anymore. Everyone now in University of Delaware knows, if you, if you tell them that we are running Bro, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, we know about it, we have worked on con logs, DNS logs, yep. So that is becoming a norm. But now we have to work again to, to transition people from working on Bro to Zeek because people still don't know what Zeek is, and they're like, we are working on Bro, but we do not, we do not know what Zeek is, so. Hopefully we'll keep this name for a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I went to an event, and I, uh, some of Seth's infectious enthusiasm rubbed off on me, and I went back to my institution, spun up Bro, uh, and went, wow, this is really cool, but why isn't it doing X, Y, and Z? And so I started emailing the mailing list with a bunch of dumb questions, and jumping into the code that I'm not really a C++ developer at heart, but I can take some existing stuff and tweak it and submit some pull requests, and then somebody who knows better than I did could fix it up and get it in there. I can file issues or bug reports, and slowly through a lot of hand-holding, uh, that, that's kind of evolved to where I'm, I have a better understanding and I'm more comfortable, and, and, uh, and yeah, I've been using it and hacking on it ever since. So, Amber, I'd like you to tell us why in the world do you want to be involved in the Zeke community? I am like Fatima. This might be a little exciting here because this is an exciting tale. Um, I have to go back a little ways to, um, and I won't go back completely, but I'm going to tell you it started in 2009 when I got personally involved with uh, open source. And then through the journey, uh, help architect projects and communities where people said that can't be done or that's hard to do or why do you want to do that and all of those communities had a mission and it wasn't a simple mission and the first community was the arm community um, where people said you can't bring the, the arm partners are not going to sit together and they're not going to open stuff well lo and behold they did sit together and out of the one of the major contributions many years ago that came out of that was a Z kernel that ran across multiple ARM boards instead of one kernel for each different type of ARM board. And so that was interesting to see that Z kernel come out and be part of orchestrating that community. And then the next community was the open compute community where they said you cannot apply principles and philosophies of open source to hardware. Well, guess what? We did. And now there is a multi-billion dollar industry around open hardware in your data centers. And that was amazing. It was exciting. And people would look at me and say, why do you want to do that? It can't be done. Well, it can be done. And then I heard about Bro, Zeke, and I had to dig into it and see what it was. And I'm a mission-driven person. I have a military background. And mission first, like, I have this thing about I'll sleep when I die. 
And the thing is, when I heard about the community and I heard about there, there were thousands of users, and then I got to digging around to see where those thousands of users were and where they were organized and where they were meeting and if they were meeting and how you all were like communicating and forming, you know, different organizations throughout the world, I couldn't find them. And the opportunity to be part of it and help you all self-organize and come together to make a safer network across the world using this software that when I look at my background in the military about those freedoms that I freely you know, would give my life for, this is a different type of freedom when it comes to open source. And then you lay over it the security and the safety of a network. It was an, it was an awesome fit. And so when you take anything that's hard to do and somebody else says, I don't know how you're going to do it. Well, I want to figure it out. And I want you to help me figure it out. And meeting the personalities, not just Robin and Vern and Seth, but Fatima, Vlad, and others like you all th that are here this week, that you have amazing ideas and you're, you're doing some amazing things, but the world needs to know about it. I want to help tell your story. I want to help you guys tell your story, and I want to help you all make these networks safer. So I'm not a developer, but I love technology. I compiled Zeke. I called Seth up and told him I'd never do it again, but, um, you know, but I did it. And I think that I have a lot to learn from you all, and I hope that you'll let me teach you all some of the skills and successes, how we've done them in the past, in other places that people said it can't be done. So I think together we've got a really good road ahead of us and some exciting changes and opportunities coming ahead. So I'm really super excited about it. Thank you. We all come to this uh, from different directions and different places. Uh, so the next question I'd like you to all to address is what is one non-technical item that you would like to see created or started? I think Keith's trying to make my job more interesting. I'm just trying to give you some things to work on. To-do list. Robin? Um, yeah, so I mean, so I am primarily on the technical side, so I'm kind of um, maybe not a technical item, but, but I would, I think we still need to uh, make it easier for people to contribute to the technical side of the project. And that is something, I mean, I'm pretty happy with how we have uh, switched to GitHub over, over time, how um, there's a lot of activity you know, on the issue tracker and how a lot of the discussions of what's going on is, is actually happening there um, with us on the core team chiming in, but also other people chiming in. Um, and to continue that and, and really accelerate development, I think um, it's, it's on us to um, make it easier to get started actually working on the code base. And that is something where I think um, over the next year maybe um, we can, um, really put in some effort in both some technical documentation. I mean, what, how do you get started? What pieces of the code um, are key for various types of work? How to write an analyzer, maybe? Um, but also more on the, on the process side. I mean, how do you, what is the process for getting contributions eventually merged into master, right? I mean, what, is, um, what should you be doing if you want to contribute? I mean, how do you write tests? Um, how to document the feature you might be developing? And really kind of, provide that information up front and, and, and make it easy. And that is something which um, in day-to-day -day work, I would say, is often kind of hard to make a priority, honestly. Um, but I think we're getting better at that. And, and, and we are having more and more resources available now these days to, um, to emphasize that area more. So I think that is definitely an area to, to work on. So I have a very basic. Um, so I have a very basic use case for that enhancement. I was talking to you earlier in this morning breakfast that after my talk was over, I was talking to a couple of people and then uh, they had really good ideas and they, few of them were developers of the open source tools and, uh, and, and then they were asking that, uh, so, they, so there were some things, so they were asking that where, are, uh, where can we find the Zeke developers? Are they in the conference? And I'm like, yeah, they are all around the place. You can actually find them in the lobby, in breakfast area, in the meeting rooms. And they're like, okay. So I think that uh, people still do not know who exactly is the core, who exactly is on the team of the core developer so that they can talk to them directly regarding whatever code they are working on or if they want to make a contribution. So I was just kind of like uh, discuss discussing this with Keith this morning that if we have a, 
like different uh, stickers on the badge. That was one of the recommendations that you, you were having. That some kind of thing on the badge or on the, um, I don't know what it's, what's called, uh, it's that, that says that I'm from the core, like core developer team or like just different color of the, um, of the, of the string. I don't know what it's called. What's that called? Okay, yeah, so different colors to signify that I am a first time attendee so that if we see first time attendees, we can actually go and introduce ourselves that, okay, I have been uh, doing this thing. What are you up to? You know, like just to facilitate interaction so that people just do not go to a person assuming that he is or she is a developer and they're like, okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were not on the core developer team. But it's just like to distinguish the core developers and first time attendees and like speakers that if people have question for the speakers, they would be like, kind of like go directly to that person. Okay, that person is wearing that sticker, so maybe that's the speak. Uh, that person is wearing that sticker, so maybe that's the that that person is speaker. And if they have any question, so I think that kind of like just to distinguish crowd in the conference might be an, a, a small enhancement for coming up conferences. Um, so it seems to me that. Uh, and, and Amber touched on this, that we have a whole bunch of different types of users and kind of two fundamental categories are developers that are writing scripts and then analysts that are kind of consuming the logs. And sometimes there's overlap there, but I think more needs to be done to kind of bring those two groups together and communicating more because from a developer perspective, it's often hard to know what the people who are just using the data need and what fields and what events and what analyzers and things like that and vice versa. Um, it, it's hard if you're just consuming the data to know what else is currently available that you're not using without kind of going into the code base. So I don't know if that's better documentation or kind of just a request of here are the things that I'd be, I'd be interested in, in seeing, but it, it, it seems like those are, two, those are disparate enough uh, groups and kind of skill sets sometimes that it, it, it's hard for the developers to predict what people need operationally and vice versa. It's hard for people using it operationally and go, well, if I just enabled the script that I didn't know about, then yeah, I would have had all this extra data. And, and so it's a bit of a, so something I think is near there to kind of bridge that gap a bit more. How are you gonna make that happen, Amber? I'm gonna tell you. Um, no, well, I, I do have some ideas. And one of the things that I would like to see, and I think some of you have seen um, where we have on the engineering side um, an engineering meeting that's a public call with the, uh, with the technical side of things. I would like to start that with folks who are interested in some of the governance, some of the community side of it, um, and get your input so that where I'm coming to the LT going, hey, I want to do these things or we need to do these things, I also have you all. So what you're going to start seeing um, on the mailing list and the first, um, I think, uh, survey that you'll see come out because there's a, one of the things I don't want to see happen and I think many of you, if you've participated in other um, communities, I don't want to see fragmentation of official channels and I want you all to be involved um, in making sure that we don't do that. And so I think just as we have those meetings with some of the core uh, contributors with, from the community, um, I think we also need to have some of you on um, calls where we discuss some of the governance, some of the implementation of things. Who would be willing? Um, one of the things you'll see go out as a survey about the Slack channel. Who's willing to use it? Who's willing to help be um, a maintainer and an operator of it? Um, so once I have that, I want to publish the survey and then execute to whatever the decision, whatever the survey leads us to. There's gonna be more stuff like that because I feel like you all have a voice and you have strong opinions, which is amazing and I love the debate, um, but we need to put that into action. Um, so I wanna give you all a vehicle to help put that into action. So you'll also start seeing some invitations to a recurring, we'll start on a monthly basis, a recurring monthly call to get that input. So. Follow the blog, follow the Twitter account, follow the mailing list because I'll talk about it in all three places. Um, so I think that's a start to getting all of this done. Um, and I definitely, when you hear me say I want to hear your input, please feel free to blow my inbox up and let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy with that. It may take me a little while to get back to you, but I promise you I hear all the requests and I don't discount a single one of them. Thank you. So. 
Are there questions from the audience? Are there things people want to ask any of the folks up here? I've got more canned questions, but they're probably not as great as the things you folks want to know. Or maybe they are. So, let's, uh, what do you think, starting with Robin, what do you think the biggest barrier to new users getting into the community is? Um, yeah, that is, so, so for me that's always a kind of a hard question to answer because for me, I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with the system obviously, at the same time I'm not the typical audience. Um, so, but I, I do believe that the, the, the learning curve is pretty steep still for um, both conceptually, I mean, it's, it's a very different system than, than um, many other tools in that space out there. Um, so just conceptually, but, but also just at the technical level, um, it's a, first of all, pretty low level tool that you need to kind of melt to um, your specific environment. And um, that is something which, um, to get the real benefit and the full power of the system, you need to kind of invest quite a bit of energy, both in, in, in learning and understanding, but also just technically to set it up and, and, and make it efficient and performant and, and, and uh, really work in that large environment that you might be targeting. Um, so I think that is a lot of what, what um, going forward, um, we hope to make easier and, and where a lot of, um, I think again, the community can come in as well and, and just provide help and support and, 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 and um, knowledge exchange and contribute to other people um, ramping up more quickly and, and becoming effective quickly, I would say. Okay, so um, I don't, uh, I feel like awareness may be, <clears throat> may be one of the issues that people might not be aware that there are so many resources available online, at least, especially now, because when I started four years back, I was just curious to know, because th that was one of my projects of my sort of summer internship that I want to write six scripts, so now how should I start? So just by typing on Google, typing uh, bro scripts has showed all the GitHub repositories of the core developers who were having small, small scripts and their contributions. So I was just following them and then I was just copying, pasting their scripts. So that was the first thing I actually started looking into. So I just like, the, I just think that maybe more awareness and where exactly to find the resources that can help, help people who are just beginners or starting might help them. Like, um, so I, I got to know about BroCon because I was looking for it. I was searching for uh, the different things that I can do with Bro and how can I contact people if I'm having problem with my scripts and who is the right person to contact. Like, they will just find that it's so stupid that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm asking that kind of question. So I think, and, and that's how I got to know about, oh, there's this conference called BroCon that happens every year. And then I think I missed my first BroCon in 2015 because I was not aware of BroCon. So after one year of my job, I got to know that, okay, there is a conference called BroCon that happens like at the end, end of the year. And then my first BroCon was like, kind of like for me a big breakthrough of getting my feet wet into BroLand. So I just feel that more awareness is required that where exactly people can find resources that, that, uh, that can help them if they are beginners. And um, yeah, and then uh, where to find those resources. Like I think the, Amber mentioned that blog posts would be, uh, Zeek blog would be a great place for looking for announcements that what's coming up in the uh, Zeek world, like what events are going on, what trainings are going on. Uh, if you have questions, there are so many resources that you can subscribe to that can help you out. Uh, and I feel that people have that feeling that mailing lists are so um, slow that what happened, because I have been subscribed to so many mailing lists where I would just ask a question and I would not get an answer for a month. And if I'm working on something very critical, like for example, memory issue, I don't want to wait for a month to get an answer back from somebody and what happens if the answer is not even valuable for me and for my organization, right? So I think that perception that mailing lists are slow, like should we even post a question whether it's worth it? But if people are aware that not all mailing lists, lists are like that, there are some mailing lists for open source projects that are not like even watched. But Zeek mailing list is different if you post. And I, and I was uh, startled by the responses. I, I asked my first question and within two hours I had an answer. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So I think those, uh, those things need to be out and people should get aware that, okay, not all mailing lists are the same. You can, if you are not getting answer from one channel, try some other channels. So there are people who are willing to help. It's not like that they just say and they don't help. They are there. It's just like you need to, you need to find the right channel to 
uh, channelize all your queries and get answers. And coming and meeting people by face in events like that is a great, uh, great opportunity that no one should miss. At least try to attend one of the events because then you know, you know people, you, you, you form more contacts, you know people who are struggling in the same boat. So you know, not only meeting the developers, but also meeting your peers who are actually using the exact same kind of deployment. And you guys can chit chat that, okay, we are, we are dealing with this issue, how do you overcome this issue? You know, so you find so many solutions just by talking to people and just finding a right, uh, right path or right channel where you can actually channelize all your queries must be a great start. So that needs, if, if that gets worked out, then maybe um, that steep curve will get like lower down in some point, some point in the future, so. Great. Yeah, I think I'm echoing some of what both Robin and Padma said, but I mean, there, there's so many resources out there, but I think uh, we need to do a better job of just having the, well, yeah, here's your getting started guide with five links to some of those resources. So. Um, I, I guess as a quick example, can I have a show of hands? How many people are familiar with try.pro, try.seek? How many people know that there's a tutorial on there that will walk you through how to script from zero to some advanced stuff? Okay, there, 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 there's quite a difference between the two of those. And, and so I, I think just kind of having some of those um, uh, that, you know, I, I, I have learned through searching where to go look for things. If I'm trying to do something complicated in a script, I go look at the unit tests and I can find an example there. But generally people don't know that. So I think we need to do a better job of advertising that. I think um, we somehow need to make sure people aren't afraid to ask a dumb question on the mailing list. Um, or maybe if there's a slightly more complicated question, people don't want to, um, you know, reply to everybody and maybe get the answer wrong or have that stored in an archive in perpetuity. Um, so I think um, that, that, yeah, somehow we need to o overcome that fear that there, there are a ton of resources, there is a great community, and we somehow just need to do a better job of um, pointing people to using that. I've actually got one question, so. Yeah. Audible. So the question was whether there's a uh, whether there's a plan to have automated tools to assist with migrating from one major version to the next major version, or other tools to support that. Yeah, I can take that. Um, so, so, sorry about that. Expensive. So I mean, so, so first two, two six to three, I think is a special case because of the renaming, right? So, so that is um, we, we we tried very hard to put like, like backwards compatibility pieces in place, but that is only, that's by definition or imperfect, I think. Um, we, we, we put a blog posting out which, which tried to kind of summarize, at least from the user perspective, what, is, what, how do, you, what do you need to watch out for, um, what, what, what kind of changes um, have been made in a pretty much a very detailed fashion, I would say, um, but it can't necessarily, it can't cover everything. Um, Automatically updating configurations is hard. I think um, we could probably, I think we could do that in, in, in individual cases. So if there's a very like, like, like straightforward um, search and replace kind of thing, um, we can probably consider that in the future, I think. Um, it's, it's like for the, for the two six to three transition, I think it would be tricky to actually do that in a way that, that produces much value in the end because um, it's unclear if we would catch everything um, in that sense. Also, I think there's a difference, you, you were referring to analyzers, so there's a difference, I think, between the user perspective on this, right? I mean, um, um, including scripts, and uh, the code perspective. So, so it's, it's um, I think at the code level, at the C++ level, the, the, the analyzer bin pack level, um, there's probably always more work to do um, for the individual maintaining the code than um, um, we can provide from our end. And we've, I think the, the, the most important thing is that we provide guidance on, on what to watch out for. And so in, in that's, um, 
And that in, along those lines, I think it would be very helpful if you could provide us with feedback back. What kind of issues have you encountered? Because then we can kind of first um, just put it somewhere so that other people kind of know, know what, um, what to watch out for. And, and second, we can in the future um, maybe better watch out for those pieces specifically and, and keep in mind that um, in the past this, this broke over here, now we are kind of changing something similar and then let's, let's make sure we, we, we do the right thing here. Can I follow on to that? Sure. Um, so uh, a, a good way to kind of make sure that we try to take some of your scripts into consideration when evaluating the impact of a breaking change is to publish packages that oftentimes when we're looking at deprecating a feature or changing something, we'll go out and see, are there any packages that are actually using this? What's the impact of it? If you can't publish the full thing because you have some secret sauce that you're afraid to share, maybe put something out there and keep some of the, that, that stuff secret. But the more that is out there, the better we can measure the impact of, oh, nobody's using this, no one will notice. Uh, we'll just throw a note in there, or maybe we can find some kind of a backwards compatible way to deal with it and something a lot more graceful if we know that people are actively using it. We're pretty close to time, but uh, a couple more real quick. Um, so <coughs> regarding the drill scripting, yeah, but I have used the command line on the site, and I found it very irritating that it took me ages to get there, but then it took me <laughs> But I'm just wondering if you So the question was about whether this, uh, if you're looking for specific strings, uh, whether the signature framework is the best place to look to uh, implement those, or if they should be done in the scripting or in a scripting language approach. Can I take that one? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I guess the answer is, is it depends. <laughs> So the, the, the signature engine, I think, is the, is the appropriate place is if it's essentially like low-level pattern matching, right? I mean, if you, if you want to match across the raw payload um, of that session, um, the signature engine is the place to do it because that's where you have access to that in an, in a, in an efficient manner. Um, in, in, in script land, you, you, first, you don't have that, that raw data anymore. And, and, and second, you usually have the protocol analysis um, that already took place and gives you like little bits and pieces. Um, the flip side of that is if, if, if you're matching against something coming out of the protocol analysis, you actually want to look at these little bits and pieces um, at that, that specific header coming out of HTTP, for example, then often the script land is, is the better place for doing that. Even though sometimes the signature engine has a few of this, this like, like fields as well where you could do it. But you get a lot more flexibility if you in, in implement that event handler. You can write your, your if conditions or just kind of keep some state maybe. Um, but it's, it's, if it's raw pattern matching on, on a lot of data, then the signature engine is, is the right way to do it. And that's, I mean, the, if, you, if you look at the default configuration, that's pretty much how the standard scripts are using it, namely for protocol detection, right? So there are all these signatures in there, which just to find uh, potential users of HTTP, of DNS, um, there's a signature in there which just kind of scans the raw traffic and then activates the protocol analyzer. And that's, I think that is the typical use case. One more question in the back. So to summarize, the question is uh, whether having the Zeek language be domain specific helps or hurts the growth of the community and whether we could grow the community by supporting other languages uh, that could work closely with Zeek. Go for it, Vlad. Um, I mean, I, I think we kind of keep an eye on other things that are out there and we haven't really, that, that the language hasn't, 
arisen out of a desire to add complexity and I don't know the language. It, it's arisen out of the fact that there are fundamental things like being able to have a set of subnets and I can look that in and I can get the most specific match. That, that the, the domain specific things are kind of critical pieces. Um, but yeah, I think it kind of gets back to somehow we need to lower that barrier entry or maybe make some kind of more direct comparisons or you know, if there's some syntactical thing that's really throwing people off because no other language does it this way and everything else does it that way, that's something that I think we look at when we talk about um, changes in, in the syntax. Um, but um, I don't know, for, from, from my perspective, I, I think we kind of take a look at how other things are doing it and there seems to be a good reason, but maybe we just need to lay out that reason and kind of lay out the, not just the, yeah, here's how you do it, but the, well, yeah, these are the benefits you get to doing it this way and actually behind the scenes it's doing a lot of cool stuff for you and yes, this will scale up to 100,000 elements and, and so on and so forth, but I don't know. And I have so, one question. Go for it. And I have a question for you all. Um, since you know that I want to include you and others across the community in helping come up with some of these solutions, not to put anyone on the spot, but how many of you all would be interested in one, joining calls like that, and two, being part of an ongo ongoing um, cycle of events to help do some of this stuff, whether it's online or in person, if we organize those um, every month and had those calls every month, how many of you all, just show of hands, would be interested in participating in some kind of Perfect, thank you so much. And to touch on the script and wrap this up, uh, we did training this year uh, for the first time in quite a while and I think we're looking to do training again next year and scripting might be an area where we want to try to expand the training opportunities, although it's, it's a really big challenge to be able to convey enough in a single half day or one day uh, training event. Uh, so, uh, to wrap up, uh, we'll be reaching out to survey all of the attendees, and if you have ideas for training especially, um, we'd love to hear what you want, uh, and then we'll see if we can actually pull it off. Um, so, uh, let's go ahead and close this all up. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out this year. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of the new faces, as well as the folks that we've seen uh, time and time again. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to pull off this event. Um, thank you also to all of the speakers. Uh, if we didn't have any speakers, then we would all just be sitting in a room staring at each other. Um, and thank you to Corelight for hosting. And of course, thank you to the Hilton staff. Um, the, the hotel was wonderful. Everything ran quite smoothly and seamlessly. And thanks very much to the AV folks uh, who dealt with all of the random craziness over the last uh, few days. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again next year. <laughs>